Uh, Scott grew up in Petersburg, worked as a commercial fisherman and a deckhand as a, as a young man. He graduated uh, from the Shelton Jackson College in Sitka, currently serves as a director of community schools in the Citra School District and prior to, uh, to his election as mayor of Sitka. Uh, he worked as an advocate for the Alaska Children uh, community and at a community and at a state and national level. And uh, he and his wife, Romy, have three kids of their own. So please welcome Scott. Wow, well, thank you. What a great turnout. Uh, it's great to be back home in southeast Alaska. Again, my name is Scott McAdams. I am the mayor of the city and borough of Sitka. Um, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about who I am, uh, why I'm running, and what I believe is at stake here. But again, uh, my wife and I, Romy, uh, enjoy three kids at home. My oldest is in 11th grade. She's 16, Caitlin. Uh, Chloe is eight, and my son Gavin is five. So I have a vested interest in my community, in my region, and as somebody who grew up here in my state. A uh, little, a little bit more background. I, I was the, um, as far as it relates to public service, currently serve as the chair of the Southeast Alaska Conference of Mayors. Have served on the board of directors for the Alaska Municipal League. Um, have served as the president of the Association of Alaska School Boards, and it's great to see Mary Becker here, another past president uh, from Juneau. But you know, about everything that I've done over the last eight years has been about community. You know, I'm one of these guys who showed up to a meeting, had something good to say, and somebody said, hey, you should run for the board. <laughs> Served on the board, uh, did some things. People said, you know, Scott, you're doing a good job. You should run for the chair. Stood for chair. Um, advanced some, some issues in our community and, and uh, made communities count during my service. But, you know, during my introduction here, there's something that, that, that I want to share. You know, I thought that at the beginning of this thing, I was going to have a civic dialogue with somebody who I have a lot of respect for, Senator Lisa Murkowski, over the course of the summer, uh, lifting issues that are important to Southeast Alaska. You know, there there's, was a governor in the governor's race, or I should, I should say a candidate in the governor's race, who was very passionate about an issue, Bill Walker. And Bill Walker said, you know, we need an Alaskan gas line now, and he made his campaign about being the all-Alaskan governor. Well, you know, I thought, as the chair of the Southeast Conference of Mayors, as somebody who sat in rooms with some of you folks and talked to a statewide audience about Southeast issues, um, I thought, you know, this would be a great opportunity to advance uh, a regional platform at the statewide level. So here I thought I was going to be embarking on a summer civics project. <laughs> well, something happened on the 24th of August. You guys hear about it? <laughs> my universe changed and the world changed. And, you know, now I believe that I'm in the fight of my life on behalf of the state that I love. Alaska's a young state. Alaska, in so many ways, has every right as a matter of equal footing to be invested in, to be developed. Our communities understand what our needs are and our communities count. And so, as I begin my remarks today, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna keep this campaign positive, we're gonna keep the dialogue above board. But I think it's important that I read this. Um, there's a group out there nationally that spent a lot of years working to embarrass Senator Stevens, working to embarrass Senator Murkowski by awarding them with uh, pork awards. They call them the Porkers of the Year, and it's called the Council for Citizens Against Government Waste. Um, and I think it's important that as I frame my case for being a local elected, somebody who understands communities, somebody who has sat in Senator Murkowski's office and asked for millions of dollars for expansion of a dam for hydroelectric capacity. I want to read this. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Scott. This is an incumbent and candidate's uh, pledge. By signing uh, this no, no pork pledge, incumbent and candidates vow not to request any pork barrel earmark, which is defined as meeting one of the following criterion. Requested by only one chamber of Com Congress, not specifically authorized, not competitively awarded, not requested by the president, greatly exceeds the president's budget request or the previous year's funding, not the subject of congressional hearings, and here's the most important part, as a local elected, serves only a local, a local, 
or special interest. Um, candidate Joe Miller signed this pledge uh, that he, he made a vow that he would not request any earmark uh, during his service if he's elected. Now, as a locally elected guy, um, I know that we have bridges, we have ports, we have got the roof on Centennial Hall in Juneau that needs to be developed. We're a young state, as a matter of equal footing, we deserve every dollar of our fair share brought into this economy. One third of our state's economy is federal spending. One, as we continue to de responsibly develop our natural resources, we will bring our state into maturity. But to say no to earmarks now is a threat to Alaska. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Joe, to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're taking opening statements. We've got between five minutes and seven minutes for your opening uh, statement to us. Joe grew up in Kansas, moved to Alaska 16 years ago, graduated from West Point, uh, the University of Alaska and Yale Law School. He served honorably in the US Army and his career encompasses stints in the State District uh, Court Judge and as a US Magistrate Judge in Fairbanks where he currently practices law in Fairbanks where he resides with his wife, Kathleen. So welcome, Joe. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my wife, Kathleen, is actually with me somewhere. I know that, well, maybe she's on the way. We kind of rushed in. Oh, hi, Kathleen. Um, and I want to thank Kathleen for helping make this possible. Had she not given her permission for me to run in April, I wouldn't be here. So you can either thank her or blame her. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about where I'm at with Alaska. Uh, there's no doubt that Scott loves Alaska. I certainly love Alaska. Uh, we both have vested interest here. Uh, Kathleen and I have made our home here. Uh, you know, maybe not as long as go as some of you, but we've been here for about 16 years. Started out in Anchorage, went up through Toke, and now we're in Fairbanks, the interior. Uh, we've had a wonderful opportunity over the 16 years that we've been here to experience the state, find out a lot about the state, have been given lots of opportunities. Started out as an attorney working on the royalty litigation for the state of Alaska and Anchorage, and then was a state magistrate for a while, became like the, uh, what was stated earlier, U.S. Magistrate Judge and Anti-District Court Judge in Fairbanks. But I've also served as a commissioner on the Board of Marine Pilots, which has given me some exposure uh, to the Southeast. And I'm also a University of Alaska graduate uh, with a degree in economics, primarily resource uh, development is the focus. Fisheries, for example, are one of the areas of study. But one of the things that really drove me into this race in April, and it's, it's not just obviously us in Alaska that are concerned about this, but it's a nationwide concern about where we are as a nation. And the reason why it's important to us as Alaskans, I, it actually has more of an impact on us than it does other areas of the, of, of the country. And that is that 40% of our economy is derived from the federal government. So we can do basically as some in the Democratic Party would do and bury our heads in the sand and pretend that this economic calamity that's coming isn't gonna impact the state of Alaska. Or we can do our darndest to fight in the direction that provides us with an economic base to move forward in the future. I can tell you, if you hang your hat on earmarks, or if you hang your hat on the federal government as your exclusive source of economic activity, that day is coming where that ends. It's not going to come under the Joe Miller reign as a U.S. Senator. I'm going to fight as hard as I can for the state in every way I can. I do want to touch briefly on earmarks. I'll do that here in just a second. But I can tell you that we have got to start moving in a direction that was intended at statehood. When we became a state, the idea was that we would be self-sufficient economically. In fact, one of the primary arguments against statehood was that we would become dependent on the federal government. And yet, the argument that was made by the founders of our state was that we have the economic resource base necessary to move the state forward. And if we don't work aggressively in that direction, whether we like it or not, and again, it's not Joe Miller going to D.C. and saying no federal funding to Alaska. I've never said that. I would never say that. But I am going to D.C. with a vision, with a future that, look, we have to be concerned about what's coming. We know the Chinese aren't buying as much debt. We know that we have $13.4 trillion in absolute debt. Future unfunded obligation, an astonishing $130 trillion. So the bottom falls out at some point. The question is when, how soon? In the meantime, what we do is we fight for the state. We fight against the regulatory burden, against the litigation atmosphere that creates a 20-year delay in the Kensington mine. We fight to open up resource access through roads. We obviously do the same sort of thing that we intended to do at statehood, but have been unsuccessful to date. And the exciting thing about where we're at as a nation, this is a purely an Alaskan-focused race, 
but we can take advantage of the move that's going on across the nation to reduce the role of the federal government, to get the government out of the regulatory burden that so hampers our resource development, to get the federal government out of this control business where they mandate health insurance of some form, where they require certain obligations that basically put down private enterprise, like that 1099 requirement that many of you are facing, $600 or more per transaction reportable. That's a dictate of the Obama administration. It's a huge regulatory burden. But you add that with everything else that is so anti-business in nature, you've got to scratch your head and say, where's the Democratic Party going? Do they just want to put this nation down back into the dark ages? I mean, for crying out loud, we're talking about a carbon tax when we're looking at a competitor across the sea, China, with 12% GDP, and yet we restrain ourselves. The whole move of the administration and the Democratic Party is to continue that restraint in such a way that we can't move forward. But we in this state have a particular burden, and that is understanding that the fiscal state of this nation is in the balance. We can be irresponsible and just pretend like it's not there, or we can be focused on directing the future of the state to the salvation of the state, which is what certainly our founders intended at statehood. Earmarks, 3.7% two years ago. Last year, 1.6%. This year, less than 1%. Earmarks are going away. Everybody in Congress recognizes it. The House is going to be controlled by the Republicans, maybe even the Senate. I can tell you the era of earmarks is over, just like Brian Rogers, Chancellor of UAF, said uh, last week. Earmarks are a thing of the past. We've got to be responsible. We have to appropriate to ensure that our interests are defended. But the corrupting influence of earmarks is over. Thank you. Now we get to the part of the presentation where I get to ask a question of each of the candidates. And I think it's important that the candidates understand that uh, we should be asking questions here that are relevant to the majority of people. I think everyone would see that would be fair. So what I'd like to do is to start off asking you uh, maybe 10 minutes of questions as to how immigration reform relates to Australians. Uh, that would be good. <laughs> But to be fair to the candidates, we also want to make sure that we, we go through this presentation without clapping at each point. If we can do that, that would be really good. Firstly, uh, Scott, we'd like to ask you a question. You're obviously well known in Sitka and to a lesser extent throughout Southeast. Um, in the rest of Alaska, you are probably somewhat of an unknown. Running in this race, would you prefer to be running against Joe Miller or Lisa Murkowski? And can you tell us why? Two minutes. Yeah. You can come up here. Uh, thank you. The question was, would I rather be running against Joe Miller or Lisa Murkowski? You know, this is an interesting question, and I, Senator Murkowski and her intentions are still are known. She may or may not enter this race. I, I welcome her. I think she's a classy person with a good voice. I don't think that she is a liberal, as she's been framed as being. I think that she is a, an Alaskan first and a party person second. But, um, you know, I think that my electoral fortunes, of course, are better if I'm running against the narrow focus of the Sarah Palin Tea Party Express. I think it's better for Alaska if Senator Murkowski has a dialogue in the room. That's a hard thing to say as a candidate. Uh, if Senator Murkowski joins this thing, I welcome her. Her and I made an oath to one another that we would have a civic, principled dialogue on the issues. That we wouldn't lie about each other, that we wouldn't tear each other down. Um, you know, and I think that's what Alaskans expect and what they deserve. So my answer is, you know, I believe I'm going to win this race if Senator Murkowski doesn't enter it. If she does enter it, I hope that either Senator Murkowski or myself are the next senator for the, for the uh, state of Alaska. Thank you. No, no, no. Kathy will be mad. Joe, your candidacy is really based, and you touched on this in your opening statement, uh, with dis dissatisfaction to how things are running in DC generally. Uh, and you bested Senator Mikowski in the primary uh, by tiring her with maybe being too establishment. How do you think you're going to get along uh, with the majority of Republican senators who are much more like Lisa than you may be? Two minutes. That's a great question. I, things aren't going to succeed for Alaska unless we build coalitions. There's no question about it. Joe Miller coming to D.C. and pounding a shoe on the podium won't do it. 
It requires building teamwork. Now, one of the fascinating things about the American political experiment right now is we have a sea change and attitude change. We see that in all the elections, the Christian O'Donnell's election that we just saw in Delaware with Lee in Utah and others throughout the United States upsetting incumbents. And it's not because necessarily there are specific problems with those incumbents. It's because there's an understanding, I think, in the United States and Alaska as well as demonstrated in the primary, that all is not right in the republic and that the crisis of leadership in D.C. is the cause for that. That we've continued to grow government despite the fact that we know all these fundamentals are wrong. Those fundamentals that are going to catch Alaska hard. Those fundamentals that are going to create incredible economic duress for the state unless we have transitioned and we've prepared for what's coming. And so, frankly, those that remain in the Senate, including the Senatorial Fund, including people like McCain, including people like Cornyn, including people like uh, Senator Inhofe, these are folks that have already contacted me that recognize that the leadership that's being brought by this new movement across the United States is, frankly, the leadership of the party, the Republican Party. They understand that they've got to catch the way. They need to understand what America is telling them in order to save basically their leadership. But I think, frankly, those that are coming in, it's to save the nation. It's not for any partisan purpose. That's the reason why this message, even though I think it will be embraced by the leadership, as we've already seen, I believe that it's a message that has broad appeal. It's a question as to who has the control. Who has the control? Is it better for D.C. to have the control, or is it better for the state to have the control? In our case, in Alaska, that's an extraordinary opportunity, especially if we can transfer that mentality and that change that we're seeing nationwide into a direction of increased state control, because Alaska owns 64 percent by the federal government. You have incredible federal regulatory burden on the state. Getting released from that, getting control of the resource base, is something that all of these new folk agree with. It's a move that I believe coalitions can be built around, and it's something that will put the state forward. Thank you. You people are slow learners. <laughs> Junoites, and this is the part where we, you each get to answer the same question so we can get a sense of how you stand on these individual things. Uh, Junoites can really smell a capital mover from a mile away. Um, and it is a very important issue to this community. Uh, Senators Stevens, Murkowski and Murkowski and Congressman Young, when asked, they always publicly supported the capital and the legislator remaining in Juneau. The question that we'll ask is, will you publicly state unequivocally that you support the capital and the legislature remaining in Juneau? We do appreciate that it's not an issue for federal senators to be involved in, but we want to know what your personal stance is on that issue. And we'll start with Joe Miller. The state government supports it, and therefore I do. It is a state issue. It's not a federal issue. It's clear that uh, with the Southeast, the way it's been pummeled over the years with loss of resource development, frankly, it is an important, critical part of the economy of the Southeast. But ultimately, it is a state decision, and I, of course, support uh, the position that our state government has in that. Um, I believe also that, uh, you know, I think it's a proper to kind of give a comparison also. I'm from the interior. You know, clearly, this is a infrastructure for state. It's one where we need development throughout the state. Uh, particularly in the southeast, you see even more of limitations because of infrastructure. We certainly don't want to pull out the carpet anymore in the southeast and say, capital shouldn't be here. But fundamentally, what it gets down to, even if you were to evaluate it on pur purely economic grounds, the studies, at least that I've reviewed, suggest that Juneau, obviously, it would not be economic to move the capital into the interior. It just doesn't make sound fiscal sense. Thanks. Let me be clear, over my dead body. <laughs> you know, I grew up in this region, and I think this is a regional issue. Having a strong capital in Juneau is not only good for Juneau, it's good for Sitka, it's good for Petersburg, it's good for Cake and Klawak and Huna and Angoon, it's good for Ketchikan, because the economies of scale, the shipping that we're able to receive, the flights we're able to get out, um, are all predicated on keeping the capital here uh, in Juneau. So under no means will I ever support a capital move. I'll never vote for it. I'll never talk about it. I'll never imply it. I'll never have a duty station outside of it if I'm ever elected to an office or ever am back home. I, I mean, I'm, this will be my home, my base. This is where I'm from. So, you know, I, I just want to, to, to speak to this 
in maybe a little bit different way. Uh, I think Mr. Miller, throughout the course of this campaign, is going to try to frame me as an Obamacrat. And that's understandable. I am a Democrat, and, and uh, we need to take some of our lumps, especially in rural America, where the Democrats haven't always understood the unique challenges and issues of a young state, of an infrastructure-poor state. And, you know, I'll continue to fight for earmarks for Southeast Alaska that are given to me by mayors and city councils and tribal leaders and chambers of commerce presidents. Uh, as long as I serve. But you know, I've never met Barack Obama. I've never talked to Barack Obama. And two weeks ago, the National DNC didn't even know my name. <laughs> but you know, Mr. Miller was hand selected and groomed by Sarah Palin, somebody who I think hasn't necessarily always been a friend of Southeast Alaska, and I think that's important to keep in mind. So thank you. Another project that's near and dear to the hearts of people in Juneau one way or the other, whether they support it or not, is Juno Access. Uh, we'd like to hear from each of the candidates on whether you support uh, Juno Access. You know, I absolutely support it. There's absolutely no doubt that the economic inter uh, independence of this region requires road access. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be up to you, though, to elect local leaders and state leaders that advocate for that. It's very difficult for me at the national level to advocate for that access, to work with the federal regulatory burdens, to open up right-of-ways for that, unless there is strong local support. And so my encouragement, at least to the business community, is that you elect those officials uh, that can demonstrate, uh, really, uh, a support for that. Um, I want to just take this opportunity. So unequivocally, I support it. Uh, but ultimately, I think that there is a need for good, strong local leadership in that area as well. Um, in part of what I've said also about the regulatory burden, any time that you empower government, you've got those controls at the federal level, it is going to restrict the ability of the community to go out, particularly when you're you know, 94, 95 percent owned by the federal government, U.S. Fish, uh, the Forest Service, the Tongas, to get those things done. So you're going to have to have a rollback of the regulatory burden to make that go forward. One of the calculations I saw the other day about road projects, a significant percentage, almost 70 percent, is due largely in part to the regulatory burden. Uh, not just the federal regulations, but other regulations delay the, the actual shovel to dirt is such a small percentage of it, in part, again, because of this, this basically bureaucratic machine that we built up that is so restrictive in our ability to move the economy forward. And let me tell you just a little bit, uh, not to be terribly responsive here, uh, but to suggest anything about me being handpicked or groomed is completely inaccurate. In fact, I'm my own guy, uh, and I can provide a, a basis for that, but I decided, based upon discussions with my wife, to join into this race, and it was for the future of this country. It was subsequent to that that we have many endorsements, Governor Huckabee, Governor Palin, Senator Dyson, Representative Keller, a number of state legislative leaders, former borough mayors in this community that support the one core thing, and that's what I just got to with this road issue, and that's rolling back the power of the federal government and preparing the state for the time that we will no longer get the federal dollars that we have today. Uh, we already know earmarks are gone. We also know that the federal funding as a whole is going to be reduced, and so we have to be prepared for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Regarding access and regarding the Juno Road, I'm probably a little counterculture in this room. I am a big marine highway transportation guy. Uh, I think that, you know, our, our ferry service continues to dwindle as our influence in the state continues to dwindle. And on that front, we need a strong leader, a proven bipartisan leader. You know, since um, if, the, if the new frame of reference here is that we're only going to support appropriations that are requested by the president, it makes sense to me that we have somebody who's a bipartisan who can work with either Republicans or Democrats to advocate through the agencies uh, for a road project anywhere in southeast Alaska or Alaska, or for a new ferry system, for a north side um, inner, inner, uh, inner Island Ferry Authority. So, again, I, I know this is a, a big local issue for people in Juneau, uh, but whatever we do, whether we get better uh, Alaska-class ferries or whether we build a road, it's going to take federal support. These are non-constitutionally mandated appropriations here that we're talking about. Uh, and getting better access to Skagway into the road system is going to require the friendship, support, and understanding of a local elected leader in Washington, D.C. Thank you.
Seniority is power in DC, and this question really applies to you both. In the position of a junior senator for Alaska, and an important recipient of things like transportation funding that you both just mentioned, uh, things like ANWA, offshore leases, endangered species acts, and things like that, how would you possibly be able to convince the other more senior senators to your way of thinking in relation to those matters? Are you being asked first? Yeah, you do. All right. Well, this dovetails with what I said earlier. Um, you know, basically what we're on the cusp of is a major change in the Congress. We already know that. We can see that in the primary elections. Most political analysts say that the House will be controlled by the Republicans. In fact, there's pretty much a consensus that that's going to happen. The Senate may actually turn Republican as well. There's something like a 25 to 30 percent chance that that's going to occur under the current calculations. So we're going to have a real opportunity to be of influence, particularly within the Republican Party, to make changes. I already noted the number of comments that I've had back and feedback that I've had directly with senators on the Republican moderate side of the party, uh, also some more conservative Republican senators such as DeMent and Coburn. And frankly, they all see this as an opportunity to change the course of government in a way that can pull us back from that fiscal brink. Uh, the fiscal brink, again, not to beat a dead horse on this, but for Alaska is a critical point that we all have to understand. If we enjoy the, the, the style of life, the lifestyle that we have, if we enjoy the level of economic activity we have in the state, we must prepare. We have to. And it is wholly irresponsible to, again, stick your head in the sand and vote along the lines of what both parties in Congress have done and drive us further into fiscal insanity. It is a fact. And so what we do is we exercise leadership. We reach out to those that, for example, have contacted me already and say, absolutely, we're going to work together to roll back that regulatory burden. So, you know, when Donlin Creek wants to go forward with this project, when we have a coal project across from Anchorage, when we have other projects here in the southeast that are important, whether it be hydro, whether it be road, that we have the ability as a, as a coalition to roll back those controls that have delayed those projects, that have made them uh, incapable of going forward in an economic sense. Carbon taxes, I don't know how many of you know this or not, but the gas coming off the slope is high carbon. It would make that project less, less of a, even a, an economic reality than what people think uh, it already is endangered by. So it is very important for us to keep in mind that to move this country forward, particularly the state forward, the resource base is where we're at. And uh, we've got to prepare for that vision. Thank you. You're getting some good aerobics today with the up and down here. This is good. Um, you know, let, let, me, let me start by saying one thing as it relates to seniority, as it relates to Senate rules, uh, as it relates to our financial future in this country. You know, I, I would offer this. I'm the one guy in this race who has ever voted on a public budget. I'm the only guy in this race who's ever had to actually cut a public budget. We just had to eliminate $1.4 million out of a $25 million budget for the city and borough of Sitka for FY11. But, you know, we didn't do it by joining uh, hands with a few folks who wanted to shame and blame and grandstand and scapegoat uh, federal spending and government employees. We did it through leadership. We put a call to action out to our department heads. We asked folks, you know, the old saying of the, and it's great to see the uh, co-chair of Senate Finance, Bert Stedman, in the room. It's, you know, the, the senator who talks to the commissioner, who's got a cleaver in one hand and a scalpel in the other and says, help me make the right cuts. Um, you know, that's the kind of leadership we've exhibited at the local level. It's what we'll bring to Washington, D.C. As it relates to seniority, um, you know, obviously that grows uh, over time, and it's been good for Alaska. Senator T Ted Stevens was good for Alaska. He didn't only build, uh, help build an airport in Anchorage and ports and harbors and bridges, um, and we need to build a bridge to catch a can's future, by the way. We, we don't need to grandstand on that one either. Um, you know, th these things have been good for Alaska. And, you know, as I serve there, as I put in my time, I'll continue to advocate uh, that we bring Alaska into the 21st century. You know, there was a time in this country when the Transcontinental Railroad was a railroad to nowhere. There was a time in this country when the Hoover Dam was a dam for no one. But it is almost impossible to imagine the development, the prosperity of the American West without the help of federal investment from the East Coast 
and from the government in Washington, D.C. I will continue on that legacy as your next senator. Thank you. All right, well, we're halfway through our shopping list of questions. Um, and they don't get any easier. Let's turn our attention to the Sea Alaska Lands Bill. When in the Senate, what would your position be on that bill as it is presently drafted? And Scott, we'll start with you. Uh, re regarding uh, S881 or the Sea Alaska Land Bill, uh, I think where we're at now, I think what we have on the table is a starting point to continue a great conversation with Sea Alaska. You know, there's one provision in this bill that I unequivocally support, and that is the conveyance of sacred sites back to native hands. Uh, that's the right thing to do. We've got a 17 million acre national forest we're sitting on, and we have 2,000 acres that are sacred sites. I think that that is off the table. That needs to be conveyed and repatriated back to Alaska Native people. Um, you know, I believe that we can have a healthy and sustainable uh, timber industry in this state. I look forward to working and innovating, being collaborative with Sea Alaska uh, throughout a, a robust dialogue on how we do that. I think long gone are the days, and long gone should be the days, of Alaska being a colony, a banana republic that ships its resources out in the round. You know, the, the next great resource opportunity that comes to us in this state, we need to do every single thing that we can to ensure that we add value to it here at the local level. It creates jobs, it puts people to work. You know, here's my pledge to you. I think a lot of folks in this state have wondered for a long time, you know, we want a good job. We want a family wage job. We want a I'm just talking to labor, uh, uh, business leaders here, maybe even a labor waged job. Um, you know, gone are the days where people had to pick between a party that would support a worker's right to organize and collectively bargain, but wouldn't open a resource project, and a party who sometimes would not support uh, a worker's right, but would open a resource project. Because guess what? In my candidacy, you can vote for a candidate who will develop Alaska's natural resources, who will be bullish about it, and will make sure as much money stays home here in Alaska in the form of wages and economy as possible. Because when you put money in the hands of working people, that's how you build an economy. Thank you. Developing the resource base is not going to occur under the hands of a Democratic majority in Congress. And frankly, it's going to be difficult even with a Democratic president. Uh, we do have opportunity to roll back uh, regulatory change by defunding in the congressional process. But I can assure you that if you want development and resource and jobs in the state, it will not happen under the current makeup of the Congress. And it has not happened. And in fact, the heads of agencies that are so responsible for de delaying the development and in fact hamstringing the development they, they come directly from the Democratic Party's chief executive, Obama. And we have got to change that. We have to because, again, this state uh, is at a critical juncture itself because it's so dependent on federal funding. Let me talk a little bit about S881. Um, our campaign uh, early on criticized the process in which that bill came into being. Our view is that it has to be a transparent process, particularly any time that a sitting senator or representative introduces the bill, it has to be transparent. Uh, our pledge that we made in the context of 881 was that if we provide sponsorship, sole sponsorship of the bill, you're going to see it on our website from the start. We're going to ensure that stakeholders are able to communicate their concerns at the time that we're actually drafting the bill, but it won't be behind closed doors with one or two players that influence the process in a way to the exclusion of others that absolutely have a hand. Now, let me make this unequivocally clear. Absolutely, the regional corporations are entitled to the lands that they should have received under ANSCA. There is no question about it. Uh, my position differs with that of the Sea Alaska bill in the sense that I believe, because of the certainty that we need, that those selections need to occur within the boundaries that were established at the time the bill was passed, ANSCA. And if we don't do that, then we have uncertainty, particularly for the users of the land resource. Like, for example, in the Sea Alaska bill, there are a whole host of communities and interest in the southeast that were concerned about that bill because they were cut off from historic um, sites that they were using for purposes of uh, recreation, for purposes of sport, for purposes of private enterprise. So imagine if we're going to open up Manska 
statewide, where any selection could occur outside of the boundaries and how that would be disruptive to private enterprise and those that have depended on the land resource for an extensive period of time. But in any event, whatever track we take, it has to be with the whole of the state engaged, particularly the stakeholders engaged, so that we can reach a decision that's best for the state as a whole. And that's my pledge to you. You know, I'm not from the Southeast. I don't have that benefit. I've enjoyed my time here. Every time I'm here, it's sunshiny. <laughs> I've been here four times since this campaign started, and every time the sun's shining. So I've concluded that you guys get sun all the time. So Kathleen says that when we retire, we're coming back to the Southeast. She loves the ocean. She loves the sun. But, um, you know, frankly, that's a good thing for you because I'm not going to be in the back pocket of anybody here. I'm going to be representing your interests as a whole for the maximum benefit of the community. That's my pledge to you. That's how I will study night and day to make sure the right results are reached for this community in the state of Alaska. And I hope that together we can ensure that we've got a future for our kids. Well, if you can ensure that uh, sun's going to be here every time you arrive, you actually might not escape. <laughs> Talking about resources, um, what we'd like to do is to ask some questions about offshore drilling. What, Scott, is your position on offshore drilling as it stands? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, as it relates to, to offshore drilling, um, you know, I'm, I'm for ensuring that Alaskan resources are developed using the highest uh, safety standards in the world. And, you know, a lot of folks are concerned about drilling in the ocean right now. And so we're going to have to do a lot of work uh, to continue to, to sell Alaskan extracted resources as the responsible choice in the global marketplace. You know, specifically as it relates to the OCS and drilling there, I have, uh, as a candidate, drafted a letter to Sec Secretary Salazar asking him to lift the moratorium. I think that there are 600 jobs out there that Alaskans need to be able to compete for. Uh, you know, here's one of the things when it, as it relates to environment in this country. You know, we, as we evolved through the 20th century, we got to a point in our history where we said, you know, we need to have clean air, we need to have clean water, we should have a clean environment to, to convey to our kids. Uh, and so we put together national environmental standards. But then you know, the universe changed and we started to offsource and, and outshore and uh, you know, deregulate and free trade. And we started to consume and, and enjoy a quality of life that was based on consumption from a global marketplace. Well, to have a national environmental policy and to consume a global product is a little bit like having a smoking section on an airplane. Because what this does is it actually transfers the environmental impacts of resource extraction to places that don't have any standards, that can't afford spills, like Nigeria. Uh, so, you know, I, I will stand for Alaskan jobs and for Alaskan extracted before a national audience as actually being the environmentally responsible choice in a global market, because we have standards here. And so, that was a long uh, answer to a short question. I support drilling in the OCS. Thank you. Unequivocally support it. Um, I think it's uh, a, a real travesty uh, that we're playing games again through the Obama administration and the folks that support him uh, in basically placing a moratorium uh, on the north, uh, on the uh, Chukchi and Beaufort when those two regions have absolutely no connection at all to what happened in, in the Gulf. The Gulf you're dealing with over a mile down drilling. Uh, many of you that are familiar with this, 15,000 PSI, an extreme amount of pressure extreme danger associated with that. When we're talking about the Chukchi and the Beaufort, we're talking about, first of all, by some estimates, 25 billion barrels of crude. Now, I worked on the trans Alaskan pipeline valuation case for several years up in Fairbanks. And let me tell you, we're at a point with that pipeline that we're at about a third of capacity. It could carry up to 2 million barrels per day. We're at a little over 600,000, 680, I think, right now. And frankly, that line is going to be continuing to lose its capacity. Now, how are we going to fill it back up? It's got to be through the Chukchi and the Beaufort. And those are developments that can be done safely. I mean, you can put a scuba diver down to the point at which the pipe hits ground. I and mean, this is nothing like where they were dealing with the submersibles and the just extraordinary difficult problem that they had in capping that spill. You aren't dealing with the same pressures. You aren't dealing with the same depths. And just think of the jobs that thing's going to create. You're talking about a pipeline across the northern part of the Arctic. I mean, extraordinary. You're talking about road access that comes along with that to resources up on the north. 
And we have to be unequivocally standing firm, hey, it's got to happen here. It's safe. We know it can be done safely. It has no connection to what happened down in the Gulf. And look, this whole anti-development perspective of the Democratic Party, we've got to stop it because that's not the future of the state. The future of the state is resource development, absolutely, in a responsible way. I mean, Kathleen and I came here 16 years ago because we love the wide open spaces that Alaska has to offer. I mean, I love to hunt, love to fish, done a little bit of hunting down in Ketchikan, got a goat a few years ago. We love the state for what it offers in that respect. But we know that we can do things responsibly. We know that the state has the capacity to do it in a way that not only keeps this, the, the, the state pristine, but also so that we have jobs not just for this generation, but future generations. Uh, offshore drilling is a critical part of that economic future of the state. And so we have to work together to make sure that that happens and stand against the anti-development forces in the Congress. And before you get to ask a question of each other, uh, we've got one final question. And people in Juneau are extremely politically aware, as I'm sure both of you realize. And we're not just concerned about issues that affect Juneau. We're also concerned about issues that affect every part of the state. What is uh, your position on the Brax legislation as it stands, Scott? On the, could you restate the question on the Brax legislation? Yeah, what's your position on it? Is that the base closure? Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, you, you know, I've been uh, working full time as a, as, as a uh, school administrator, raising a family, serving as mayor. so. I had to think about what BRACS even was for a minute. But I, I tell you, um, Alaska is strategically located uh, both in the North Pacific, um, in the Arctic. You know, for the same reasons that we need to have a robust uh, air transportation industry here, we need to keep our bases healthy uh, and active. And you know, as Alaska's next United States Senator, I will continue to fight for uh, our military bases in the state. They're critically important. I think it's also important that we continue to fight for our United States Coast Guard, uh, make sure that uh, our programs here are fully funded, uh, that their mission and their purpose is, is, is executed in protecting the economy uh, down here in Southeast Alaska. Uh, and finally, I think that the, the next thing we'll be thinking about in this state is the Arctic and transportation in the Arctic. Uh, you know, I, I, I envision that it won't be long before we are opening a Coast Guard base in a community maybe like Nome Kotzebue uh, to patrol and ensure a safe uh, transfer of goods and services throughout the North Pacific, uh, I, I mean through the Arctic. So uh, I do su fully support our bases and our military presence in Alaska. One of the things that's happened as uh, the, the kind of composition of the Senate has changed over the years is we have fewer and fewer combat veterans who serve in the Congress, both in the House and in the Senate. I had a discussion with Senator McCain a few days ago where we talked about our joint interest in the national security of this nation. Something that a lot of our congressmen and women don't recognize is the geostrategic importance of this state. Uh, the BRAC closure, obviously, I mean, that's a, a byword up in Fairbanks. Of course, we had Fort Ritz that was on the, or Fort Wainwright that was on the chopping block, Eielson Air Force Base. It's always a specter in this state. If you don't have advocates that understand through not only their combat experience, but also through kind of a geostrategic sense, of where the state sits vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, I can assure you that we're going to be on the chopping block because there's always an eye to consolidation of military posts for basically the backyard dollars that other states will receive. So it takes a strong leader. It takes somebody that's willing to basically advocate on behalf of the state where there are enumerated powers. This is one of the things that I've made clear from the beginning of my race that we have become so overexpanded with this welfare state that we have, this dependency state, that the enumerated powers, such as defense, and keep in mind, folks, the defense dollar to this state is about 40% of what we receive of federal funding. You tie veterans into that and the veterans services, again, enumerated powers, you're talking about even more. That is something that this state has got to continue to embrace. We have the highest veterans population per capita of any state in the nation. I mean, it's just substantial. 70,000 veterans, when you include dependents and their families, a very, very high rate of, of veteran and military affiliation. And so we in the state understand the importance of the military. Many of us have served, or if we haven't, we know somebody that has. And as this nation is surrounded by people and by peoples that continue to be more aggressive in their foreign policy, certainly China sees us as a threat. 
We have other threats out there, such as Iran. Don't fool yourself. There are people out there that want to do us harm. This is not one big happy family. We're America with exceptional values that really strike fear in a number of our international neighbors' hearts. They don't like an idea that we're a people that can make decisions that have fundamental rights that government can't take. We have to have a strong military. We have to have a strong advocate. And we have to have somebody with experience that understands what we need as a state and as a nation for its security. So I'll fight hard to oppose any closure of any base in the state and also to expand the Coast Guard present in the, uh, in the Arctic. That's another critical area that we need to develop some infrastructure. Thank you. Before we get on to your questions where you can terrorize the candidates for yourself, uh, they now get a chance to do that to each other. You have 30 seconds to ask a question, two minutes to respond, and then 30 seconds of rebuttal. And we'll start with you, Scott. Well, thank you to the Chamber. Thank you to, to, to Joe for a dialogue here. Um, my question goes back to the critical role of federal investment in Alaska. Um, you know, as someone who grew up here, I understand the legacy of Ted Stevens, uh, what he did in building this state. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, a great mark, and this is, is meant to be a compliment, a great mark of, of a well-done uh, university education for foreign attorneys to be able to argue both sides of, of an issue. Uh, folks have to do that every day in that profession. Um, but, you know, I, I, again, I need to ask, why would we want to limit the federal appropriations for Alaska to uh, the president's requests and through agency requests? And do you think now is the right time to end federal investment to help build our communities, develop our resources, and build a gas line? Thanks, Scott, for the opportunity to uh, clarify where I'm at on federal funding. You know, if I didn't say it before, I'll say it again. The era of earmarks is dead. We're talking about a percentage of the budget to this state of less than 1%. Uh, other folk recognize it that are not decision makers. It certainly is coming. But the main amount of appropriations that come from this state, over 99%, come from outside of that. We have to be more responsible in appropriations to ensure that what the state needs to get it ahead, its infrastructure is provided for, is done at the appropriations process. Now, let me tell you, we already have a formula. We're a donee state under the highway funds that we receive from the tax on gasoline. Uh, it, right now, we get 6 to $7 per dollar that we put into that. That goes into our infrastructure. That's not something that's going to get changed. That's not an earmark. I think a lot of what comes out of the other side and what comes out of the media is a misunderstanding of what earmarks are and what component of our overall spending that is. It really, now, let me, let me say some kind words about Ted. Um, oh. Kathleen wanted me to remind her, or remind folk that we had a great deal of respect for Senator Stevens. Uh, Senator Stevens, in fact, my wife made macaroon cookies for. He enjoyed those immensely. And I had a high degree of respect for the senator. Uh, he fought very hard for the state. And I only hope I can fight just as hard. But we're in a new political era, not just at the state, but also at the federal level. And the fight's got to be taken to a different level. You know, at his time, that may have been the right approach. At our time, there's a different approach that has to be taken. And that's an approach to get the resource base back so that we can carry ourselves once those federal dollars end. Again, those federal dollars, folks, are going to end at some point. The question is either when does bankruptcy occur, because it's on the horizon, or when is there a restraint because of budget that are get, getting balanced because there's a recognition in Congress that we cannot continue to expend at the rate we're expending. But we've got to be prepared for that. And the only way that we can as a people is to capitalize on the natural resource which again, we follow the Obama model, which is the Democratic Party model, that's restraint of development. In fact, overall, from the Democratic Party's perspective, development is a dirty word. The resource is not there seen to be used, but to be conserved as effectively a national park. And in fact, the National Democrats essentially see the state as one huge national park. That is not the future for the state. It cannot be the future of the state. We've got to develop on those resources and the human resources that we have here in the state to move ourselves forward, and we got to have vision. We can't be irresponsible in our approach. You've got 30 seconds for a rebuttal, if you'd like. You know, back to this issue of uh, legislatively vetted appropriations, or earmarks. Um, you know, as a mayor, I went back to D.C., uh, sat in the Department of Agriculture after talking to a uh, mid-level professional there about what was possible for my town to expand our hydro dam. 
And she said, well, we've got, you know, one pot of 300 million and one pot of $400 million and rural electrification here and you might qualify for this. And I said, ma'am, that's fascinating. How do you appropriate these dollars? And she said, well, mayor, we put together a staff panel. I said, a staff panel? Like Johnny from payroll and the new kid down in the mail room and somebody from across the hallway? She said, well, we put together a staff panel. No one understands our community's needs better than our local elected leaders and then our delegation. Don Young will tell you this. Ted Stevens would have told you this. I think even Lisa Murkowski would share this view. So if we embed, if we cede our ability to ask for the needs that we understand in the local community to an agency, we have removed the decision-making power from the mayor's desk to the secretary's desk in Washington, D.C. I think that is wrong. Thank you. And Joe, you've got 30 seconds to ask a question of Scott. Scott, you recently indicated that you could not think of a solitary vote that you disagreed with Senator Begich on and that you were a Begich Murkowski moderate. Uh, so I would ask you, uh, with respect to the big bank bailout that uh, one or both of them voted on, the Wall Street bailouts, Obamacare, TARP, and the other stimulus bills that have been passed out that have tripled the deficit, tripled the federal deficit. How do you think that that is a responsible way to expend funds, and how do you expect to pay for it? Uh, thanks, Joe. I think there's about five or six questions in that question, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to uh, start from the top. You know, I have said that uh, I think that all of the enabling conditions that led up to the crisis in Wall Street happened over multiple administrations, both Republican and Democrat. And, you know, we had the fox running the hen house in Wall Street. We had full deregulation. We had no oversight. Uh, you know, people oftentimes ask me as a small town mayor, Scott, why do we have so many cops in Sitka? I'll say, well, you know, the problem is, is we don't have coordinating agencies. But the thing about security is, it always costs too much. It always is too much until the moment it's not enough. That's where Sen Senator Murkowski found herself when she had to vote for the TARP bill. Now, I could stand here and grandstand and shame her and, you know, mischaracterize her record if I wanted to, but I won't. If my police chief came to me and said, Mayor, if you don't pull the trigger now, this whole community is facing a catastrophe, I'd be derelict if I didn't take his professional advice. When Bush's Secretary Polson came to Senator Murkowski and gave her that analysis, she made the decision she thought was best for, for the United States. I will never support another bailout, but it's hard to fault her for the vote that she made, and she's, you know, she's paid dearly for that vote. Uh, as it relates to some of the other things, you know, uh, uh, how do you say a, a baggage crat? An Obama crat actually sounds better. But, uh, you know, I've gotten to know Mark Begich over the course of this campaign. Uh, he's been supportive of my campaign. I got problems in the health care bill like everybody else does. My main problem with it is uh, a problem I've had with federal, uh, the federal government for the last eight years as a local ele elected leader, and that's unfunded federal mandates. You know, I like the fact that kids aren't going to have to deal with pre-existing conditions anymore and not be able to get insured. But I do have a problem, and I want to analyze the, and take a good deep look at forcing people to have coverage uh, because I, I wonder about the, the, uh, the merits of that. So thanks for the question. And 30 seconds for rebuttal. Now, the point is you can't have your cake and eat it, too. You can't say that you support these things, but there are problems with them. It's one or the other. And the point is the approach that basically embraces all of these expenditures that triple the federal deficit is an irresponsible and very short-sighted vision. Those are things that absolutely have to be looked at. We understand that when we bail out a business that's too big to fill, you know, when we talk about private industry that has made bad decisions and we pump them full of money in response to those bad decisions, it's part of what has made us so anti-competitive. It's part of what has taken away the ability for us to compete internationally because we've put in not just socialism at the state side, but we've also put it also at the side of private enterprise in such a way that this country cannot continue to get ahead unless we show some vision, unless we're focused on moving this nation ahead and recognizing the crisis that we're in. All right, you've done well sticking to time. We've got five minutes left before our hour will be up, so we'll take some questions, first of all, from chamber members. If you're a chamber member, what we want you to do is to stand up and speak up. And Ben. 
thank you, Richard. Uh, I'd like to ask this both the Mayor McAdams and Mr. Miller. You both mentioned Senator Stevens. He obviously suffered a huge loss with his untimely and tragic death last month. And at his funeral, his good friend Senator Inouye of Hawaii spoke about their friendship and a special relationship between our two states. There's a bill pending in Congress called the Akaka Bill, named for junior Senator Daniel Akaka of Hawaii, that would extend a great deal more self-determination and uh, rights to the Native Hawaiian people. And I believe Senator Murkowski supports that legislation. And I think Senator Stevens certainly would have supported it. Congressman Young has already passed the House. Will you vote for the Akaka Bill if you're sent to the United States Senate? And if not, what does that say about your commitment to indigenous peoples in Alaska and the rest of the country? Do you really support ANCSA? And are you going to work to repeal or undermine what ANCSA did for Alaska Natives? Because not supporting the Akaka Bill would indicate to me that you don't feel very strongly about the rights of Native Hawaiians. Who wants to take that first? Joe, how about you? Might as well. 60. 60 seconds. Um, let me answer this question in this way. I would not vote for it until I read it. And if it's another one of these two or 3,000 page bills, forget it. Because I'm probably not going to have time to do it. Frankly, we've got a lot of legislation going on where people ask for gut responses to, you know, intricacies that the senators and representatives don't even understand. I, I, you know, I'm troubled by the description. I'm certainly not fully aware of all the implications of that bill. I would love to see it. Absolutely. I've spent time in the bush. We've spent time with Native peoples. We absolutely want to protect their identity. We absolutely want to treasure the diversity they provide to the state. But I also know that if this is something to modify ANSCA, that it's something that would have to be looked at very closely. I believe that we have to, as a people, remain one state. There's no question about it. That is the desire. We respect our differences. We champion the diversity of the state. But this is the state of Alaska. Working together, we can make this future happen. But if we're split as a people, and if we're competing in different angles that create problems for us all, it is not going to happen. We have to work in unison, and we have to want, frankly, it has to be across the aisle as well. It's something that we've got to bind together as a people to do, and we can't be fractured into such a, a patchwork quilt of peoples that we can't get the true nature and the objectives of the state, which is resource development forward for the country and for the state itself. Thank you. Let, let me, you know, let, let me let me answer this question like this. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine Alaska, contemporary Alaska, without the presence of our regional and village corporations. Uh, these um, organizations are economic engines in our economy. Uh, they are standard bearers um, for continuation of the culture. Uh, and I think that the Hawaiian, uh, um, the Hawaiian land settlement claim uh, issue is something this long over, uh, over you know, it's been a long time and, and uh, it's unbelievable that it hasn't been addressed yet. Uh, but as Alaska's next United States Senator, you know, we have half of America's tribes in this state. My kids are citizens of Sika tribe of Alaska. You know, it's important that we fight for full federal funding of the programs that make our tribes work. It's important that we continue to, to support the Small Business Administration 8A program. Uh, because that brings $5.2 billion to Alaska Native people and our communities overall. But you know, <clears throat> I will fight for Alaska. I'll stand up for tribal people. I'll stand up for um, our communities. I understand our communities. Uh, I love the state. And uh, you know, I appreciate the question. It, it, the issue of, of in Hawaii is an important one. Uh, in general, I, I can say I would support it, to answer your question directly, um, in concept, because I think that the native claims and native sovereignty is an incredibly important issue. One out of five Alaskans is Alaska Native, and we need to keep that in mind as we have a dialogue in the state. Thank you. It's not very often you get a question that's longer than the answer, so Ben gets surprised. Any other chamber members? John, send off. I'm a member of the uh, Alaska Canada Energy Coalition, which uh, advocates the construction uh, over the next decade or two of a hydroelectric power and high system between Wrangell and British Columbia to be able to market uh, uh, surplus hydroelectric power uh, to BC and the North American grid. What are each of your vision with respect to the development of hydroelectric, more affordable energy in Southeast Alaska? Scott, we'll start with you.
Well, I tell you what, I won't wait for the Department of Energy to put together a bill coming down from its secretary in the wisdom of Washington, D.C. to fund the hydroelectric intertie. I can tell you that. But I will fight for earmarks to connect our communities. Uh, I can promise you that. Uh, as it relates to the transmission line between uh, Wrangell and British Columbia, you know, I think that that is a concept whose idea has yet to come and yet to arrive, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we still have communities, villages in southeast Alaska that spend 70, 80 cents a kilowatt hour for fuel-fired electricity. The first order of business needs to be to connect southeast Alaska through earmark, through, I mean, the private sector is not going to come in here and do this. Um, so that's my first priority. If we ever get to a point in this region where we've got such excess capacity for energy that we can export, I'll be fully on board and interested. But now we need to connect southeast Alaska's communities and we need to expand our hydro capacity. We need to build more hydro projects. We need to build more dams and more lake tap hydro uh, because affordable electricity, reliable transportation, and an educated populace is the backbone of any economy, and it requires federal support. Thank you. Any, any time that you say that there isn't room for private enterprise, I think you're making a mistake because, again, you're hanging your hat on the Feld model that has gotten us to the point that we're at today. There is absolutely no question there's a federal role. I mean, when you look at the roadless policy in the Tongass and how that's inhibited hydro projects, when you look at the need for permitting to get the intertie across to Canada, those are all federal issues. Of course, the feds are restricting. They're not facilitating. In other words, it's the burden, the regulatory burden, that makes it less likely for those projects to go forward. But when you're talking about a possible hydro project such as icy straits, underwater turbines, certainly the technology isn't there yet. But we're talking about, by some estimates, 25,000 megawatts. i got to tell you, if you're producing that kind of energy, there is going to be private enterprise that supports it. But you've got to have the regulatory capacity to do it. In other words, you've got to get the feds out of the way so that you can put that intertie across, so that you can get the underwater cables that are necessary to bring power back to where it can be utilized, to put it into the grid. And that is going to require rolling back some of that federal regulatory burden. But any time that you're dependent on the feds, let me tell you, it's a dead end. Certainly there's a role, but not in the direction where you've got a bankrupt federal government. We need to work forward to make sure that these things can go forward, that we get the feds out of the way in a way that we can put these projects to work so that we don't have to suffer through those high kilowattage uh, costs. And Kathleen and I know what it's like. I mean, it's not as bad as you guys have down here. Of course, Juno's lucky because of hydro, but not when, that, of course, that line gets taken out. But we dealt with 30 cent or so kilowatt per hour while we are in tow. The, the fuel-generated power, that's a dead end. It absolutely is. So hydro is certainly a good, clean source that could answer a lot of the energy costs in the southeast. All right. We haven't got time for any more questions because we're two minutes over time. So we'd like to uh, thank the candidates and we hope you haven't found your visit to the Chamber of Commerce uh, too harrowing and arduous. And we hope you enjoy your uh, visit in the always sunny capital city. Please thank our candidates.